Here we go. Okay, it looks like we are all here. Um, we have some people filing in on social media. Hello, Travis from Linden. We have someone calling us from London today. Um, there's a Linden, Utah. So, um, Natalie from Salt Lake. Um, a comment on YouTube, Tay Toast says, woot woot. Um, Todd from Salt Lake, hi guys. Toby, um, are you ready? Ready. Okay, great. Let's get this started. Um, hello, uh, everyone in internet land. My name is Kathleen. Uh, welcome to our live season announcements. I am our digital content producer, so I do our social media, content marketing. Um, if you're a regular on uh, these live broadcasts, you probably recognize me. Um, so we just wanted to start off by first off thanking our sponsors. We have some really generous sponsors who um, are, who have just been so generous this season um, and we wanna recognize them. So first is George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation, who is our season sponsor, the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Program, the Grand America Hotel, Squatters Pub Brewery. And actually speaking of donors, we are honored that the George S. and Dolores Dory, uh, Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation has awarded Utah Symphony Utah Opera with a challenge grant. All new and increased contributions received until May 1st of this year will be matched one to one. So if you give $100, they'll give $100. Um, we invite you to double the impact of your gift and help us meet this challenge by making a donation today. For more information, go to usuo.org forward slash donate. Um, and we have a couple other people on this call. Toby, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Yes, it's been my honor since 2010 to be part of this organization and vice president of Symphony Artistic Planning, working, collaborating with Terry Fisher and our new CEO, Steve Rostick, and the wonderful staff and musicians about many seasons. And we're particularly excited about 2122, as you see with these wonderful guest artists that are joining us today. We're honored and very pleased. And we really do think that 2122 is a spectacular season here at Utah Symphony with back to full orchestra performances and uh, hopefully also full audiences with your help in joining us. Thierry, would you like to tell us a little bit about 2122 and how excited you are about it as well? Hello everyone. Yeah, you said it all Toby. It's going to be a very special season for many reasons. First of all, because of what we're going to perform and with whom we're going to perform it. But also because this is following, you know, the times we all know we're still kind of in the middle of it. So I know that in Utah, we are reopening the Abravanan Hall this week um, with a little bit of public coming <laughs> in the audience. And that's so comforting to know that we'll be able, the musicians will be able to project sounds and their uh, musical commitment and excellence to, to people in the hall. So I think it will, it will just be what we all need to have, which is much more togetherness and sharing uh, what we are producing. Otherwise, this season is going, I, uh, excuse my question, am I going to speak later about the season or this is my moment? Um, actually, if you could tell us a little bit about the season now, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. No. Okay. No, I mean, um, since I arrived in Utah, I always wanted to feel more connected to the nature because the, the beauty of this state is so spectacular and inspiring. So on different levels, every season, we try to have pieces, um, connecting us with the nature. This season, um, 
in particular, will have four composers writing directly about nature, four living composers. Uh, no, one is not uh, alive anymore. The first one is Kuzatis, who wrote a violin concerto, which is a commission by our wonderful concert master, Madeline Atkins, called The Maze, directly inspired by the Canyonlands National Park, south in, in Utah. And we have uh, our composer in residence, Arlene Sierra, who is with us tonight. And she wrote for us, and I just heard Arlene that actually the score is ready from your um, new piece, Bird Symphony. So I can't wait. Toby just told me this a few minutes ago. So I can't wait to see the score. That'd be fantastic. And we will be also performing her Nature Symphony a little bit before in the season. And we are making a connection uh, with a Brazilian composer uh, called uh, Costa Lima. He wrote a piece called Oi, uh, representing, it's a commission, the Sao Paulo Symphony uh, to him to be connected with the Beethoven Pastoral Symphony. And he wrote a storm, a big tempesta, which is uh, featuring our very um, wonderful percussion section uh, in Sao Paulo and in Utah as well. So we make a little bridge um, with storms between the two countries and the two orchestras. And last but not least, we started last season a huge project we had to stop because of the pandemic. And it's we were performing all the season through uh, different movements from, from the canyons to the stars by Olivier Messiaen. And we should have finished the season by recording it for Hyperion. And uh, we had to stop that, but I'm so happy we can go back to the to the project. We will play at the end of the season the four movements from the Canyons to the Star that we haven't played yet, and then continue with a, with a workshop with the orchestra, and then we will play it in Springdale, uh, close to Zion's Park, and then finally record it during the summer. So this is our connection with the nature. Of course, I'll be performing uh, on my side, uh, uh, composers like Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, uh, Haydn, uh, as usual, but the, the main part is that. We have the pleasure to have two artists in residence with us. One I already mentioned is Arlene Sierra, who will be present many times with us during the season, involved with education and the community as well. But I can't wait to work uh, with, with you, Arlene, that'll be really good to have you around and to inspire us with you, the beauty of your music and your personality and the way you talk about the arts in general. Thank you for having accept that, accepted that role. And the other one is an equal uh, huge honor is to have Hilary Han with us for this season. We are talking for long about this project and Hilary will be with us. She's incredibly popular in Utah, much loved by everybody and she will be playing two concertos with us. Plus, hopefully, I don't say more for now, one or two little surprises. You will hear it when we'll be ready, but a surprise don't need to be announced. So what am I talking about? Um, we'll have also other, an amazing artist, including Stephen Huff with, his, uh, with us tonight, uh, Joyce Young as well. Hello, both of you. We'll have Inmo Young, Benjamin Grossmer, Ingrid Fleeter, and another great violin, um, American violin player, Augustin Hadelich. Uh, Toby will speak later. This is also the season, as I like to say, the season of the future, because it's the first season that um, I, I'm going to do a little bit less weeks to give room for the organization to have many, many, many fantastic guest conductors as I am approaching the end of my tenure. And um, the Utah Symphony has to, uh, select a successor. So Toby will speak about these fantastic guest conductors who are coming during this, this season. Um, I'm also going to perform something very close to my education. <laughs> it's a Swiss composer called Arthur Honegger. Uh, he was a composer who was very regularly performed by Maurice Abravanel during the years. He, he loved all these composers, Darius Milo, uh, the group of the six, uh, Francis Poulenc and Onegger, and I've, believe it or not, play, performed very little Swiss music um, during my tenure. Uh, we will be celebrating the 75th anniversary of John Adams as well, uh, performed almost the right day of his birthday, 
uh, a piece not very much played by him, but very energetic, and I like it very, very much. The Slonimsky's Earbox. It's a so short piece by Adams I like very much. And oh, I forgot to mention another uh, great soloist, the great clarinet player Anthony McGill will join us to play the Nielsen Concerto. And um, yeah, I think that's what I had to say as a first um, introduction. But again, I think the pleasure to coming back, the pleasure to create the future and the pleasure to be close to the nature is what will surround this season. Yeah, there's a lot to be excited about on this season. It's going to be very cool. I mean, if anything, just to get back into a concert hall. Um, and we also have another special guest on here. We have Steve Brozovic, who um, he's our newly instated CEO. Uh, Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, it is great to be here announcing the season. Uh, I've just hit my six month mark here, uh, having come from the Nashville Symphony, where I was chief operating officer for the last five years. And it's been an interesting time to join the organization as we've been trying to navigate the pandemic. And uh, as we say, continually pivot from, from one style of programming to another. And you know, poor Thierry and Toby on this call have, I'm, I'm sure, worked on reprogramming with the concerts starting up this week and through the spring five or six times while I've been here just to make sure that we get it right with the number of musicians we can have on stage. Do we have an audience or not, et cetera. But it, it's a wonderful time to be here. It's, it's an incredible organization and we have so much to offer. And I'm completely entranced by the combination of the Symphony, the Opera and the Deer Valley Music Festival as one organization and looking ahead at what we can do by maximizing that relationship with ourselves and, and finding out what it means for our future. So I, I look forward to seeing everybody um, next season. I'm looking at, at familiar faces on the screen and it'd be great to reconnect with, with Joyce and Stephen and Hillary in uh, New City from where we originally first met symphonies ago. And I've just met Arlene Sierra on the call this right now. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing her work and, and spending some time with you Arlene in person. So welcome all of you in advance and we'll see you soon. Excellent, um, thank you so much, Steve. So for those of you who are watching live right now, um, thank you so much for joining us. So stay tuned. We're going to announce more parts of the season as we go along. Um, and also stay tuned because at the end, we are doing a giveaway. We are drawing the name of a winner for, sorry, let me rephrase this. We did a giveaway this week. Um, and if you signed up ahead of time, we will be drawing the name of this person live. Um, they will be winning two season tickets. Um, it's a Masterworks 9 package, so there'll be nine concerts throughout the year. A $100 squatters gift card, great restaurants, the, uh, stay at the Grand America, treats from Monty's Tart Cherries, and some fun swag from USUO. We have some fun like polo shirts and stuff, so you can wrap your, wrap your team here. Um, and we, for those of you who didn't sign up ahead of time, don't worry. We are actually going to be doing some trivia throughout the broadcast for a chance to win um, a pair of season tickets. And we have three different uh, season tickets. We have a pair of season tickets for the films and concert, a pair of season tickets for our entertainment package, and personally my favorite, a pair of season tickets for the Masterworks season. Um, and so the way this game works, we have a couple of trivia questions. Um, a lot of the works next season have nature themes. We have a bird themed symphony going on. Um, and so we thought, you know, what is more appropriate than the Utah State Bird. So we have, uh, so many years ago, we had a seagull for a mascot. Uh, he had like a whole costume. The people who made the jazz bear costume made this costume. Um, and so we're gonna give you some trivia questions about this mascot and we will pick a random winner to win one of the three uh, season passes and we'll announce that at the end. Um, so just the way the game works, uh, the more you comment, the more you answer, you don't have to get them right. We will just be picking a random person who is answering these at the end. But the more you give your answer, more likely you are to win. Um, we will tell you the correct answers after about 20 seconds. And with that, Thierry, would you like to give our first uh, trivia question? Sure. In 1997, we gave a name to a seagull mascot. We held a competition to name him which of these names did we choose? A. Gulliver, 
B. Symphony Sam, C. Seymour, and D. Harold. It's very easy. Yeah. I mean, I think they're all good names. <laughs> you have a few seconds left. Those answers in the comments. And the answer is Seymour, Seymour Seagull. Um, thank you so much, Terry. Um, we will continue talking to you through this. Um, but first off, let's welcome our first guest to help us reveal part of the 21-22 season. Um, Robert, give it away. You know, for me, art and music is just a humanizing thing. Uh, to me, if I took music and literature and painting out of my life, I think it would be a shell. And I think it would be somehow inhuman. Welcome, Stephen Huff. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, where are you uh, calling us from today? Well, hello everyone. It's wonderful to be with you and to see these familiar faces. I can't wait to see people in the flesh again. It seems terrible. We're all on these screens all the time. And I'm in a hotel in Manchester. I have a concert with the Halle Orchestra tomorrow, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it's, it's wonderful that we ca can connect in this way. Yeah, excellent. Do you want to reveal what you'll be performing with us this season? I'm going to be playing the first concerto by Brahms with you this season, one of the greatest pieces in the repertory, maybe my favorite piano concerto if I had to choose one. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm going to be playing with you. And I believe the conductor will be Rune Bergman. That's correct, Rune Bergman. And I just realized that we've invited you many times here before, and it's always with Rachmaninoff, so forgive us. And I realize it's, we did the Rachmaninoff three, two, one countdown with you. We, we had you here in that order. So, uh -huh. so we have to do four sometime. And, and I guess we now know that Brahms, we should have invited you for originally. <laughs> <laughs> well, and of course, it, we, we, we had a COVID casualty, didn't we? Because we had plans for last year, which had to be canceled because everything in the world was canceled. Um, so I'm, I'm so delighted that we've been able to find another week for me to come back. I love being in Salt Lake City. It's a great orchestra and hall, and I love the people there. And so it's a huge pleasure. I'm looking forward to it tremendously. And, you know, you've been here and you were supposed to play the Emperor and then the fourth concerto opening our season in September with Thierry. But you also, let's give a plug, you also have recorded all five of them recently with, with Hanu Lintu and uh, your wonderful management, send those to me because I'm always asking for free gifts. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they're on the ball about that. <laughs> yes, they're wonderful. So I've always wondered how you have time beyond playing recitals and concertos to be an author, a composer and many other things. How, how do you manage this? Do you you separate the season like Mahler used to do, compose in the summer and then perform the rest of the year? No, unfortunately, I, I don't have that luxury. It takes me about a year to write um, a serious piece, you know, a, a sort of 20, 25 minute work. So I tend to write in spurts. I'll get a lot of ideas at the beginning. Someone says, as, as they did, actually, I, I just finished a recent piece of string quartet uh, mm -hmm. for the Takash Quartet. And I was approached 18 months ago, would I write a quartet for them for recording they're doing in a tour? And I was thrilled. Um, and I, I immediately started sketching stuff, but it's taken me about 18 months to finish the piece. So, and I do a lot of it, of course, you, you, I'm, I'm, I am busy, I was busy playing concerts, but also there's a lot of time like now in a hotel room or sitting waiting for a delayed flight or on the flight. And, and so, I try and use some of that time uh, to do writing, and that's what I've, I've done throughout my whole career. And you also have a book that came out recently I really enjoyed reading called Rough Ideas. I, I assume that meant to rhyme with your last name? Yes, you've got it. <laughs> so people at least... <laughs> and I'm afraid that whether that's a, a, a corny pun or not, but I, I have another book on the way called Enough. So. <laughs> I, and then I guess there's tough after that. We'll have to see where it goes from there. But, but Stephen, you talk about in your book something that a lot of even our audience and our supporters have asked. 
shorter concerts, no intermission. We gave them that this year because of COVID. Yeah. But, but I'm sorry to say that we're going to make you wait and play the Brahms after intermission in November. Yeah, I hope you don't mind. Not at all, Toby. No, I think it's just flexibility. I think there's been a time for 100 years where all concerts have been pretty much the same. You know, they start at eight o'clock, they're two hours long, there's a 20 minute intermission. And I think the COVID period has maybe just suggested that there's a different way of doing it sometimes and to mix. And I think some orchestras will have a shorter version of their subscription concert. I don't know, on a Friday evening, because people need to get home or, or on a Sunday afternoon. And I think we, we can look at different ways of doing this, maybe concerts later. Um, you know, I'd quite like to go to a concert after dinner, maybe 1030 at night or earlier so that we can eat after the concert. Uh, I know certainly traveling around and, and, and Joyce and Hillary will be able to, to, to second me on this. It's often very challenging to find somewhere to eat because you come out of a concert at 10 o'clock at night and everywhere's closing down. You know, and I've actually had situations where I've literally run to catch the chef before he or she is leaving the kitchen door and said, please, just a Caesar salad, something to keep me, uh, keep me going on the road. Now, I usually have to be the bad guy and push people out of the way talking to the soloist saying, the kitchen's closing, we gotta go. So I, I can get to be the bad guy, the bouncer. <laughs> But tell us something a little bit about the Brahms, um, because if this really is your favorite piece, you have a lot of things to think about it or to say about it. Which, by the way, we're getting a lot of comments on social media. We have Sabrina, who loves Brahms, Travis, like they're all very excited about this, so. Uh, well, I think most of us love Brahms, except Wagner didn't and Tchaikovsky didn't. But, but apart from that, all, all our sensible music lovers, I think, love Brahms. I think this piece just it, you know, it's a young piece. It's one of the first mature works that, that he, he left us with. It had a rocky start. Is it, am I going to write a symphony? Am I going to write a piece for two pianos? He wasn't sure. He finally settled on the idea of a piano concerto. And then he reaches so high with it. And, you know, it's not flawless in the sense that perhaps the second concerto is. You know, the orchestration has a few moments when you think, well, it's a little bit muddy here or or maybe this is this, or but all that is swept aside because I think it's like a great mountain. You just feel that it's a great human statement. And I often have tears in my eyes playing it. There's a moment in the last movement when the horns come in uh, after the, the piano cadenza with the, in the major, and it really does sound like um, the sun rising. And I find it a very, very touching moment. It's like Brahms understands what we've all been through and some of us still going through right now. And I think this is how music unites us all. We, we go into a concert hall and we're taken into a different dimension by this incredible music that we play. And I think, you know, not being able to do this for the last year uh, has shown us how, how much we've missed it and, and how inc what an incredible treasure it is for all of us. Yes, and the fact that you're playing at, with the Halle, is this one of the first times that you've been playing since COVID, especially in the UK? I, you and Thierry collaborated recently. Yeah, not in the last year. Um, ah, but uh, no, I there have been quite a few odds and ends of concerts going on. Um, I've played, um, well, the Bournemouth Symphony, I've played twice with them and the uh, Philharmonia, and I'm playing with the London Philharmonic uh, in a couple of weeks. So most of them, of course, without audience, although there was a brief time when we had, you know, 50 people in the ho in a 2000 seater hall, that kind of thing. But um, there have been bits and pieces going on, not as much as in Asia and in Australia. Someone was telling me that now they have full houses. And the encouraging thing for us, I think, is that um, people are really anxious to get back into concerts. And so the worry is, will people just want to watch online now because they've got used to seeing streams and, and, and archive material? Not a bit of it. The ticket, the box offices were hot with people trying to buy tickets and many people going for the first time, people who discovered um, classical music during this period, either by listening to the radio or whatever it was, they want to go and discover this new thing in the concert hall. So that's great news, I think, for all of us who, who love this art form so much. Stephen, Stephen, thank you so much for being with us today and best wishes for your concert tomorrow and 
stay safe in in um, in your home, and we'll see you in November see in a Bravenel Hall for Brahms One. It's going to be awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. On the second half. <laughs> Um, and with that, we have a little more trivia. Um, Stephen, would you like to give us our next uh, trivia question? Yes, indeed. So, um, how did we decide on Seymour's name? So there are four options here. A, Santa gave it to him as a gift at our annual family Christmas concert. B, we used an applausometer and Seymour won by a landslide. C, his name was going to be Gulliver, but the music director at the time, as music directors can be quite bossy, made an executive decision to go with Seymour. It wasn't Thierry, of course. Or D, people voted for it on MySpace. So there's four choices for you there. And with that, we have our answer, which is there was an applauseometer there. And yeah, people love Seymour. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephen. It will be such a pleasure to see you perform again. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Excellent. Um, and so let's go to our next guest. Um, Robert, would you like to take it away? Arlene Sierra, how are you? Hi. Hi. Hi, Hello. Hi everyone. Um, so Arlene is going to be our composer in association um, next season. She's supposed to do it this season, but you know, something happened. Um, but she has been commissioned to write a piece called Bird Symphony for us. So hence all of the seagull questions that we have. Um, and we have a couple questions for you, but one thing I was wondering was, you know, since we were supposed to premiere this work, I think it was supposed to be a month ago from a month from now, technically, um, what, if anything, has changed about this piece since you've had you know, some time to think about it, um, especially like in relationship to the current world? Yeah, so I, I started my new piece, Bird Symphony, probably a month before COVID hit the West. And, um, and, you know, sketching out a new piece and listening to the news and, you know, the sense of this tidal wave was approaching because I'm, I'm living in London. Um, and when we started to get news of, of COVID hitting Italy, um, we really knew in the UK that we were next. Um, so I had to think about wrapping up my teaching at the university and getting my son home from school. He's eight years old. So, um, you know, a lot of complicated things to think about in the midst of, you know, getting a new piece underway. Um, and I had decided already to do something based on birds and on bird song. Um, I had a few pieces, uh, piano pieces and um, a few other kind of different things that are based on bird song in different ways. So I, I was looking forward to the, the chance to expand on those ideas in the orchestra. Um, and then suddenly life in lockdown, you know, it was really such a, you know, as for all of us, of course, but artistically and compositionally such a strange situation. And in some ways kind of a gift because composers are homebodies, you know, we need to stay home and that's how we get our work done. And, um, you know, it seemed like that would be great. But on the other hand, um, with my son's schooling and just, you know, running one's house like a ship and sort of keeping everything <laughs> under lockdown, um, that sort of made it all complicated, but um, I still managed to keep composing and it really got me through, you know, just um, to have that goal of, you know, at least a couple of hours every day composing, no matter what else was going on. Um, and no matter what the news told us about what was happening, um, you know, that escape of creating was, was so important and such, you know, it realized what a gift it is to be an artist because you can really, you know, have your own world to concentrate on. Um, so it shaped the piece, I think, because I had already planned out, uh, four movements for a symphony, which was surprisingly traditional for me. My 
first symphonic piece with three movements quite willfully and not doing four movements, but, um, but with this piece I wanted to really tackle that. Um, and I realized that I needed one movement to be about caged birds because in a way we all became caged birds. <laughs> so, um, and also um, some of the music uses the recording of bird songs. So it's a sense of capturing something fleeting in time and locking it down, but also capturing it in time. Um, so those ideas started to influence the piece. So, um, so I have a movement that's really based on the sound of caged birds. Um, along with a, a recording of a wild bird. Um, and in terms of other things about the piece, it was also kind of a, a love letter to Utah in a funny way, um, because <laughs> I haven't actually been to Utah yet. Um, the closest I got was Yellowstone when I was eight years old. It's funny because I have an eight-year-old at home now, so I'm <laughs> sort of connecting that um, with, you know, vis visiting that region of the country. And I've you know, flown over many, many times. I've just never gotten to Utah before. So I had this calendar of, of landscapes of Utah for 2020. So I kept looking at that. I have a few pictures around. Um, and that kind of worked its way into the piece in terms of concentrating on bird songs heard in Utah um, that I've not heard in person before. So that's kind of fun. Um, and also thinking about the ancestors of birds. So thinking about um, various dinosaurs that have been found in Utah. So I actually have a movement which I wasn't sure how honest I'd be about the title, but I think I'm going to stick with the movement title, which is Utah Raptor, which is an actual very bird-like dinosaur that was found in Utah. <laughs> it's the official so, state dinosaur, actually. Yes, so. it yeah. has to be, right, with that name. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, so it, I spend a lot of time with this piece thinking about being frozen in space and in time, you know, because we all feel that 2020 was a year that kind of didn't happen um, or, you know, happened in a way none of us could have anticipated. Um, and thinking about being caged like some birds are and also about the, the sweep of time, which of course Utah and its history really gives you a sense of even if you haven't been there yet. <laughs> um, so all of that is sort of played into the piece. But it's not completely done, I should tell Carrie. Um, I still have a, several weeks left of planning out the percussion and fixing the heart pedalings and stuff like that. So, so it'll be a little while yet. But with the extra time, you know, having a delayed premiere, it's a gift to a composer's luck because there are always details we have to fix. <laughs> so can I mention, Arlene, I think you've revealed that we shouldn't have had a mascot of a seagull. We have a Utah Raptor mascot from now on, thanks to you. <laughs> so this is brilliant. I, I, I'm much happier. I, I wasn't around for the seagull, so I don't miss it. Um, <laughs> can I ask you something about Nature Symphony that we're doing the week before Bird Symphony, when you're here two weeks in a row in April of 22? Um, I'm very intrigued that the middle movement, you were inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe's you know, artwork, did you? do that from afar or did you go to Mexico and, and kind of hang out around her area in Santa Fe? I think she spent many years there. Right. Uh, again, love from afar. Um, I, I most just really through art, you know, um, you know, going to the Museum of Modern Art in New York as a kid and going to Tate now that I live in London, you know, those paintings are there and um, her work has always been a, an inspiration to me. And um, a close family friend of mine, um, Malcolm Barron, is uh, the main photographer of Georgia O'Keeffe's work. So I've always seen beautiful photos of her work. Um, and I think his book has just come out a few months ago. Plus, my mother's a painter. So the whole the whole experience of a painter and of a woman painter. Um, and my mom paints um, in the Hudson River Valley. So she's very much affected by landscape. Um, so all of that resonated in so many different layers for me. And I guess just to, to wrap up, the fact that the last movement is called Bee Rebellion and Utah is the beehive state. So I think just subconsciously you've been involved with us before we even had a chance to invite you. So thank you. There's a spiritual connection. And, and please pronounce the piece we're doing of yours in November. I, I always have trouble with it. Please pronounce it for us. Oh, there are lots of options. Uh, I think it's kind of solidified into aqua though, if that's the last one. Um, so you could say it like Spanish, Aquilo as well, it's up to you. It's, it's a Latin name. 
Um, so you could go either way. But it's the name for the Northwest Wind. That's, that's where that title came from. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Arlene. We can't wait to see you in November and twice in April. Yeah, so I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and do you want to give us your last trivia question? By the way, we have, I believe you, uh, your family is telling you that they love you on the YouTube page. So just say <laughs> hi. <laughs> I'm sure they're in the other room. Hi. Um, but yeah, do you want to give us the last, uh, your, um, your trivia question? Yes. Okay, my trivia question is, uh, why did we decide to get a mask on? A is where just as good as any sports team. Absolutely. Uh, B, it was required as part of our orchestral contract at the time. <laughs> Sorry, I'm giving this news away. Um, C, there was a trend in the mid 90s of orchestras having mascots. Or D, we wanted to give our young fans a fun mascot. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes the orchestra contract gets us by surprise, but the answer was we just wanted to give our young fans a fun mascot, um, which we're not sure if they actually found that fun or not, but yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, we will, are so excited to see you next season and hear what you have for us to play. And I guess we're going to go on to our next guest. You have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Robert, take it away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Joyce's World. Hello, Joyce. How are you? Good we day. have Joyce Young here today. Um, and would you like to reveal what you'll be performing with us next season? I'll be performing Liszt's first piano concerto. Excellent. This is going to be a really cool piece. Toby, do you have some questions for her? Yes, and I know that you get to work with Thierry that week. And um, I, I just did want to mention what great artistic efforts you made last season for us when you played Gershwin Concerto in F three times with us here and about. And then a week and a half later, let's fly to Palm Desert, play this once, and then fly back. And so Thierry came from Europe. The orchestra came from here, of course. You came from your other concerts. And we had a great time. And I, I will reveal that the best part to me beyond the music was the wonderful Whole Foods lunch we had as a takeout. So take it away. Tell us, no, tell us about the list uh, in, the, in relation to, do you play number two, by the way? I think it's sometimes called the triangle concerto, right? Right, I, I don't play the second piano concerto, but I do play his earlier. It's kind of a piano concerto. I believe it's for a small orchestra called Malediction. So I actually learned that first um, before the first piano concerto. So that, that was kind of like easing in. But this first piano concerto by Liszt is really the piece that he nitpicked for 23 years to come up with this final version. Um, this piece is really has these four movements that are stuck together. There are no real silences in between. So it's like opening a window and arriving at a next movement. and um, going out the window again, it's just, um, it's such a journey. And it used to have um, little, little breaks. And over time, it became sort of one continuous journey. It's, it's just um, very virtuosic, as we expect from Liszt being a superstar for um, this great instrument, this piano, and he made it um, into an instrument that um, can be bigger than life. He really came up with the concept of piano recital, that piano is no longer a side instrument that accompanies others, but it could really stand as the, the main attraction in the middle of the concert stage. So, and he played them himself. So it's, um, 
it features all that the pianist can do, uh, but within it, there's a lot of beauty and poetry as well. A lot of spontaneity, and I really look forward to it. It's like a adrenaline jolt, and I think we'll just have, um, I'll just have the best time with Thierry. Um, each night will be different, and we'll just um, go on, to, yeah, this spectacular journey, so I look forward to it. Yeah, I can see Thierry is already planning where he's going to take time uh, the second performance. <laughs> I think this piece has a lot of give and take because it has that um, the freedom, parts that fall out of time, kind of improvisatory, and it's kind of like an operatic moment um, where different characters appear and tell their story. And then we're back to that very um, almost metronomic, quick, um, pulsating bits. So it's it's sort of this back and forth. And um, because the piece is um, in one continuous journey, we get really affected by what happened just minutes ago. How we transitioned into it will change the way that we play the next bit. So it'll be, um, yeah, it'll be very interesting and um, different every time. I think big chance for the cello too. I think quite a few cello solo moments there, so. Yeah, this features, yeah, quite Matt a number. Johnson will have fun, our, our wonderful principal cello, yeah. Great. Tell us a little about the Patreon project you're doing. And I think I said it right this time. <laughs> yes, it's a new platform for um, all kinds of freelance um, musicians, gamers, um, anyone that want to interact with their audience um, by creating original content. And when everything shut down, I really felt that need to connect with um, people that love music and that um, I used to, you know, talk about music, play music, go to receptions, and this was my life. And when it was all cut off, I just um, felt the need to connect. So this is a small um, community that I have, very loyal to piano classical music, the things I usually talk about. So twice a week, I make little videos. Um, one is educational, one is more fun. And I walk you through my creative process or walk you through a Rachmaninoff prelude, for example. And we talk about it after, you send questions, I make a drink, I answer. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun way to connect. And I'm really grateful I found this um, little group of people that love it as much as I do. Um, and I just want to say, I think that this is kind of a cool example of the way like the music industry is changing that, you know, when we were hit with this big pandemic and everything, we all had to like make a bunch of pivots and everything. And this idea of just getting online and having people like who love your content to go on there, you know, and support you and for you to give them something to that's just really cool and really unique and not something that classical music fans always get to see, you know, they don't always get to see inside the artistic process. Um, that is, very neat and I think it's very forward thinking. Yes, it was actually um, very um, difficult in the beginning because I didn't know how I would put myself out there in the digital world, like appear online and say like, what can I do for you? I mean, this was a, not an option and having a platform like that was very helpful. That sort of eased me into doing something, sticking to something I want to stay with until the concerts can happen again, not um, do something completely different, but still stay focused, stay um, true to my craft and and then be able to, yeah, connect easily. Um, so we have another, um, we have another trivia question if you wanna give that to us. But first off, we have someone on YouTube, Sarah P is way excited about the list. And then we have, let's see, Mary W, she loved the Gershwin when she saw you play it and she cannot wait for your next performance. Um, do you wanna give us your next, uh, the next trivia question? Absolutely, here it is. Utah Symphony and Seymour have since parted ways. Why? Is it A, Seymour retired with his wife to Florida? Is it B, after a long, year-long contract dispute, Seymour decided to go freelance, or is it C, between the costume no longer being comfortably inhabitable by a human and the observation that the seven-foot birds only, it 
are only endearing to children on a television screen, we decided to send Seymour to a better place, or D. Seymour got so demanding about things like having low fat crickets in his dressing room that we had to fire him. He now drives an Uber in Utah County. <laughs> a sad end for Seymour. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, um, this is a mascot that's had a very complicated history with us. Robert, do we have the questions up? Okay, excellent. And the answer was C. Um, apparently we found the costume and it was just very smelly when we found it. So we just weren't sure what to do. And of course, I mean, like any mascot, like the Easter Bunny or something, there are always going to be kids who are terrified of it. So he's moved on to a better place. Thank you so much, Joyce. We cannot wait to see you um, next season. We're very excited. I'm so excited as well. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Good to see you all. Good to see you. <laughs> um, and then we have our fourth and final guest. We are very excited. Robert, would you like to take it away? Um, 57th annual Grammys. I just got my medal at the nominees reception. Never had a medal for anything before, so that's exciting. And surprise, we have one of our audience favorites, Hillary Hahn. Hillary, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, it's good to be here. Hi, so would you like to explain your role next season? You have a big role. We are very excited for this. Um, what, will, what, will you, uh, sorry, what will you be doing? What title have you given me? Oh gosh, it's Artists and Association, correct, Toby? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's an artist residency and I'm really excited that I'll be working with the orchestra a couple of times. Usually, as a soloist, I return to a place one time every two years at the most frequent. Sometimes I get lucky and come back every year, but to get to return within the same season, explore different repertoire, it really gives us a chance to look at a range of repertoire and a range of projects. And when I do an artist residency, I like to really look at the organization and see what your interests are and then see what my interests are, come up with some interesting projects that really fit the collaboration, but also you know, connect with the audiences as much as possible, connect with the community. So I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to that in Salt Lake City. I've been going to Salt Lake City for a long time. And so to have this as a sort of mini culmination of our collaboration so far is really special. Yeah, um, and we are very excited about this. We, I mean, I can speak for myself that I've just always very much admired your career and like your willingness to like culture, uh, cultivate and nurture like musical creativity um, within communities. Um, so we're getting a ton of comments in from YouTube. Uh, we can tell that we have like a ton of two set violin fans. Hi friends. <laughs> uh, um, but with that, so, we know that you have a big long-standing relationship with Terry and we are actually gonna let him um, chat with you a bit. So we are gonna bring him on. It's good to see you, Thierry. <laughs> okay. And now I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yeah, good to see you too, Hilary. Yeah, we spoke a bit this last days it was great but always good to see you and can't wait to have this project with you we still have a lot of things to talk we'll be talking next week for all these surprises can't wait uh now it, it's it's such a, an honor to be able to have you with us for more than just one concerto and see you maybe in two years so can you tell us just um briefly about the two concertos you're going to play with us yeah, it's two concertos plus an extra piece too, right? The um, yes, yeah. it's like yes, two sure. and a half, two and a half concertos <laughs> or three, depending how you look at the definition of a concerto. So I'm going to be doing Brahms concerto, 
I was very happy to hear I'm not the only Brahms soloist on the season. That's kind of nice <laughs> for audiences to tie together. And, you know, I think when I think about how Brahms was criticized when he was alive and then how he was also received when he was alive, I, I think that a lot of what we know about Brahms' popularity has built on itself over the years. There's a tradition to playing pieces by Brahms. And I remember when I was a student learning Brahms chamber music, I really understood how challenging like the formation of the architecture of an interpretation for Brahms is. If you play Brahms with no expression, it, it does sound a little bit confusing, but if you know the structure and you have a unique interpretation, it's mind blowing. And so I'm really excited to um, explore sort of the traditions that you and I both know and that the orchestra is used to playing and then see where we can bend them to be really unique and powerful. I think with a piece like Brahms that you learn early, it's easy to sort of get into a repetitive cycle of playing it. And actually over the past few years, I've been really thinking when I get back to it, because <laughs> I've been on sabbatical for a season and then this season as well, like I, it's almost my second season off the road. Like when I get back to Brahms, what am I going to do with it? So I guess we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. And then um, the second the second visit <laughs> will be a concerto I am obsessed with, but I'm so glad we get to do Thierry. It's the Hinastera Violin Concerto. And on that same program will be Sarasate's Carmen. So it's going to be really quite a range of music. And yet there's this sort of spark to both pieces that I think will be really great for the audience to hear back to back or separated in the program, however we decide to do it. Um, but the Hinastera, I am I am really obsessed is the word because I have been um, just chomping at the bit to be able to play this piece in a concert for the last three years. And I finally had it scheduled for this season. I was gonna play it for the first time and nothing has happened for me with the Hinastera this season. So I'm really glad that when everyone comes back together, that this can be a piece that I can be, you know, learning, exploring, performing. And so I'm really, really glad we get to do that. And I should just say, I'm, I'm enamored of the piece because it has so many intricate, fascinating details. He takes, for example, the structure of a concerto and turns it way upside down. It starts with the cadenza and then every movement has sort of different orchestration. Um, there is a movement that's just, it's like a, a, a study, it's called a study, but it's really inventive and it's just thirds. And you would think thirds are so straightforward and you learn them in scales from when you start doing double stops, but he puts them together in a way that you almost don't recognize them as thirds, but they are. And that's just the kind of nerdy little fascination I have. I think the whole piece has such an impact and so much scope. One thing that I think, um, you know, it, it has been underplayed, I don't know why, but the New York Phil premiered it, it was written for them and never played it again. And it's not because the concerto doesn't deserve it. It's just one of those flukes of programming, I think. And then it's the same when you look at all the different orchestras around the world, it just really hasn't been played that much. So this is a chance to have a clean slate with it and really show what the piece can be. And Carmen is Carmen. I mean, I haven't ever played it. I'm learning it. What? I was going to learn it for this season. I've loved it forever. And I never learned it. I kind of, I think my teacher gave me a choice. Do you want to learn Carmen or something else? And I was being sort of rebellious against the, the popular things. And so I chose the something else. I never got back to Carmen. And um, yeah, I just love it. I can't wait. So I'm going to be learning that for um, next season as well. That's great. I can't wait to do um, both concertos with you. I mean, both two and a half concertos with you. <laughs> and um, uh, the Rina Stera, you, you really managed to make me interested in the piece. And thank you for that. Because when I looked at the score, it is really something to put alive. And I love this piece in the middle, this movement in the middle, written just for the 22 principles of the New York Philharmonic to thank them. So it'd be great for our orchestra also to have some intimacy in the middle of the concerto, which is everything but not a classical concerto, as you rightly said. 
And I think this is a perfect combination. So it'll be very challenging for all of us. I know it's very, 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 very virtuoso for, for you. Um, yes. And, <laughs> but, it's, but you know, if someone yeah. tells me something's impossible to play, I, I just have to play it. So uh, here I think we, go. <laughs> we, we have some common grounds here. So <laughs> we take the challenge with the entire organization. Yes. Yes. Well, Hila, we thank you so much and um, we can't wait to have you with us and to um, be surrounded by your creativity and your commitment to be close to audiences and young people. And let's make uh, something very special for all of us. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what else we can develop in the, yeah. in the residency around these plans because we're talking about some um, new music and like working within the community and things like that. So I'm just really excited to see where we land and we'll keep everyone posted. Let's speak next week as planned and we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll send all the ideas <laughs> after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much, Kiri, for um, interviewing Hillary for us. And we have one final trivia question. So if you guys have yeah. been playing along, this is your chance to win one of three season tickets um to our next season hillary would you like to give us um yes. last, yeah i'm gonna read it off my phone so seymour got a special gift from the orchestra when we named him what was it a a hug from santa claus a miss america style banner with his name and a chance to conduct the orchestra b a two-year contract for the principal trumpet position C, a 10% off coupon to Denny's, or D, a formal portrait from local photographer Don Busaith, which hung in the Bravanel Hall from 1997 to 2003. I mean, I know that I would have wanted the I want to know. Coupon, right? <laughs> um, uh, so what he got was A, he got a hug from Santa Claus, which who wouldn't want that? A banner with his name, and he got to conduct the orchestra for a bit. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's a that's a three part reward right there. Yeah, lots of value in that prize. <laughs> well, anyways, thank you so much, Hillary, for joining us. This was so fun to talk to you. Um, and thank we you. cannot wait to see you next season. And we cannot wait to uh, collaborate with you um, on these projects. I'm really excited to go back to Utah. So Yay. I'll see you all there. Have you. Bye. 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 Um. I, I think I, I think if I was one of the first players next to the podium, if Seymour was conducting, I would have had to duck uh, for the wingspan and the baton. Wingspan. <laughs> <laughs> Seagulls have huge wings. They're kind of scary. They do. Yeah. Um, um, so we have a grand prize winner um, for our giveaway. But first, we wanted to thank our sponsors. Steve, did you want to uh, do the sponsors? Absolutely happy to. Um, you know, just once again, we always want to thank our sponsors who make everything we do possible. Uh, and first and foremost, the George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation. They are our senior, senior season sponsors, excuse me, and have been for many years. Uh, we'd like to thank ZAP, the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Program, which you know, every resident here participates in, um, the Grand America Hotel and Squatters Pub Brewery. Great burgers. Very good. Um, and so Steve is going to draw the name for us here, but the grant, oh, we have a bowl. Great. Um, and this winner will get two season tickets to um, Nine Masterworks concerts next season, $100 squatters gift card, uh, stay at the Grand America, treats from Monty's tart cherries or chocolate covered cherries are delightful, and some fun promotional swag from USUO. Steve, who won? Uh, I have drawn. Amanda Mulia. Ah, excellent. Sweet. Well, congratulations. We will contact you through the email that you provided for us. Um, and we picked three random names of people who participated in our trivia game um, for two non-transferable season tickets for the following. Uh, let me bring them up. My phone is thinking. Let's see. Okay, so for the first one, um, a pair of season tickets to six Masterworks performances to Sage Knapp, um, K-N-A-P-P. -P. 
let's see, a pair of season tickets to our entertainment series. The winner for that is Emily Johnson. Um, and this is features performances from Pink Martini. We're gonna have a holiday concert with Jody Benson, a Rodgers and Hammerstein celebration and Cirque de la Sinfonie, which they have like fun, um, kind of like Cirque du Soleil, like dancers come in. It's a very fun show. Um, and for the pair of season tickets to our films and concert, we have Don Fitzgerald and our uh, films and concert next uh, season are gonna be Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, Back to the Future, Home Alone and Harry Potter 5. Um, and we will reach out to you through private message. So make sure to check your DMs and your junk mail and we will get you set up with those tickets. Um, Steve, do you have any final words for us? I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today and for your excitement about next season uh, and to Thierry and Toby for putting it all together. Uh, Kathleen, Robert, everyone for participating. Uh, Carolyn, helping make this announcement possible. Um, getting everybody back in the hall starting this weekend for concerts is going to be an amazing experience. And as an institution, even though we know that we're still coming out of the pandemic slowly and there's a lot of progress yet to be made, uh, we just wanted to move forward and be positive and energetic and create a season that we hope all of you will want to come back in here. So we're looking forward to seeing you back in the hall and we'll see you soon. Um, Terry, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Oh, you're on mute. Hello, does it work? Yeah. Now, like Steve, I want to thank everybody for, for this even tonight. I would like to encourage everybody to come back to the hall. I know it's limited places, but it's super safe. You know, you all know we wouldn't do it if it wouldn't be as safe as ever. So uh, we need you people, we need you guys in the hall. We want to play for you. And uh, I also would like to thank Steve for his first season as a CEO with us. I think you've already brought fantastic spirit, great ideas and fantastic leadership. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to have you and uh, thank my Legendary partner, Toby, we had a rough year, changing plans every couple of days, but we managed. And uh, nobody has any idea how many hours we spent together doing many versions, but uh, I couldn't have done it uh, without your creativity, Toby. Thank you so much. Yeah, and your patience. <laughs> and thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, everybody. And see you in the hall very soon. It's a great pleasure, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Uh, season tickets are on sale today. So call our box office or go to our website. See you next season. Bye.